Let's take a look at the photoelectric effect. What is the photoelectric effect? It's simply when we shine electromagnetic radiation, light, or ultraviolet rays into certain metals, the metal will emit electrons. And they're called photoelectrons, but they're just like any other electrons. And what's really interesting about the photoelectric effect is that if we think of light as being a wave, we have a different set of predictions as to what's going to happen with those electrons compared to if we think of the light as being made of particles or photons. So we have an experiment that's going to determine whether or not light is a wave or a particle, or at least that's what we think it's going to do. And it was Einstein who in 1905 worked as a patent clerk and produced three very significant papers, one on relativity, one on Brownian motion, and one on the photoelectric effect. And it was the one on the photoelectric effect that actually won him the Nobel Prize, not the one on special relativity. Let's look at what the wave model would predict as compared to what the particle or photon model would predict. Now if you've got waves coming in here, they're electromagnetic waves, and that means they're oscillations of electric and magnetic fields. What that's going to do to charges such as electrons in the metal is make them shake around. And so there's going to be a gradual transfer of energy. And the electrons should get shaking more and more and more. Well, eventually they'll be shaking so much that they'll overcome the bonding to the metal itself. And they'll be emitted from the metal. Particles, these photons, very different predictions because the Photon energy has to be given up all at once, and so all that photon energy would be delivered and given to one electron. Now, if that energy is enough, it can cause the electrons to escape, to break the bonds with the metal, and to escape the metal. So we can kind of think of it, we can think of waves coming in here and hitting pucks on this ramp as compared to say balls being thrown and hitting pucks on this ramp. Now the waves would come in and they'd kind of push the pu push the pucks up and then they'd slide back a bit and they'd kind of gradually make it and then drop off the ramp. But there'd be a gradual transfer of energy. And if we're talking about a brighter light coming in, that would mean that we've got bigger waves coming in. That would mean that we have larger amplitude waves. So if we have brighter light, we're expecting that it'll take less time to emit the electrons and they'll probably be fired out with a little more kinetic energy. Now in the photon model, we've got one photon delivering its energy to one electron, a one-on-one -on -one situation. And if we're talking about brighter light, that means that we're rolling more bowling balls, and that means that we'll knock more pucks off the ramp. In other words, if you have brighter light, you got more photons, and that's going to mean more photoelectrons. But they won't have any more kinetic energy when they're fired off the ramp. They'd have the same amount of kinetic energy. Now, let's go a little deeper into what we mean by a photon. A photon is the smallest bundle of energy in an electromagnetic wave. So it's really a quanta. It's the smallest bundle. It's a quanta. And we can't get half a quanta of energy. We've always got to get a full quanta of energy or a full photon of energy. If we've got, say, red light, the red photons have less energy than if we have, say, a blue light, which has a higher frequency, a shorter wavelength, and therefore a higher energy. So the the red photons don't have as much energy as the blue photons. And that is, photons, if their radiation is of a higher frequency, that is a shorter wavelength, then they're going to have higher energy photons. And as it turns out, that photon energy, which we'll call E, is proportional to the frequency of the radiation. So if we double the frequency, our photons become twice as energetic. If two quantities are proportional to each other, there must be a proportionality constant. That proportionality constant is given the letter H, and it's called Planck's constant here. And it's equal to 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. That's Planck's constant H. 
or we can write the energy of the photon in terms of the wavelength. Remember the universal wave equation is V equals F lambda. But in this case we're talking about electromagnetic waves so they travel at the speed of light so C is equal to F lambda and that means the frequency should be C divided by the wavelength and that means we can write our photon energy as HC divided by the wavelength of the light. So if we're given either the frequency or the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation then we can always figure out the energy of the photon very quickly. So in this problem here's the wavelength that means our photon energy will be given by HC divided by lambda which will be 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds times C which is 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second all divided by our wavelength which is 630 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. If we carry out that calculation, we'll get an answer of 3.2 times 10 to the ne negative 19 joules. And you can check out that the units do work out here. The meters will cancel out with the meters, seconds with the seconds, so we'll be left with joules of energy. And you might recognize that as being the equivalent to 2.0 electron volts. Remember that 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules is equal to 1 electron volt. So we've got twice that amount. So we've got 2 electron volts of energy. Let's take a deeper look at the different predictions made by the photon model versus the wave model. The first critical and big difference between the photon and the wave model would be no time delay versus a time delay. In the wave model there's a gradual transference as the elect oscillating electric fields shake the electrons around and eventually give them enough energy that they're fired out of the metal. Whereas the photons they come in give up all their energy to a single electron. If enough energy has been given to that electron then it's going to be emitted and it will be instantaneous. So time delay versus no time delay. Second thing is about a cutoff frequency. In the wave model there isn't a cutoff frequency. That is if we use a lower frequency it's probably going to take more time to transfer the energy to the electron. But eventually you should be able to transfer enough energy at pretty much any frequency that you'll emit some electrons. Very different in the photon model because if the photon just doesn't have enough energy to overcome the bonding energy of the electron to the metal then you're not going to get any electrons at all. So a very big and critical difference would be cutoff frequency versus no cutoff frequency. And the third difference has to do with the intensity of the light coming in. In the photon model, higher intensity means more photons and more photons will mean more electrons. In the wave model, higher intensity means greater amplitude greater amplitude should reduce the time delay and increase the number of emitted electrons. And if you do send in higher frequency light, the wave model predicts that there should be a quicker transfer of energy and you'll probably have less time delay and perhaps a greater kinetic energy to the electrons being emitted. Whereas the, whereas the photon model predicts that if you have a higher frequency of light and you're above that cutoff frequency, then you should be producing more energetic electrons. There will be more energy left over. But there won't be any more electrons emitted because of that. And the winner, the clear winner, was the photons. These predictions were correct. So let's just kind of review that very briefly. First thing is no time delay occurred. The electrons are emitted immediately. Secondly, there is a cutoff frequency. So if the frequency is not high enough, photons don't have enough energy, no electrons come out. And then the third thing, if we shine light on the electrons, then more light, that is more photons, ejects more electrons. But they have the same kinetic energy. Quite different from the wave model. Let's take a little bit more of a quantitative look at the photoelectric effect. With the photons coming in and knocking the electrons out of the metal. So let's, using arbitrary units, let's say it takes seven units of energy 
to remove an electron from the metal. This number here is called the work function of the metal. And it's usually given the symbol phi, but in some textbooks you'll see it expressed as a capital W. Now, what that really represents is you've got metallic bonding. This is a metal. And that means you've got a free sea of electrons. All these electrons that aren't attached to any particular atom. But they are generally at attached to that lattice of positive ions. And so there's a certain bonding strength there. And so it takes a certain amount of energy to knock one of these free electrons out of the metal. And that's what we call the work function. So let's say we've got two types of photons. We've got some red light with red photons, and we've got some blue light with these blue photons. We send in the red photons. The red photons only have six units of energy. That means they won't be energetic enough to overcome the work function. And that means that the frequency here is below the cutoff frequency. So for red photons, we'd say that 6 eV is less than 7 eV, and what that means is that there's going to be no PE effect, no photoelectric effect. Now, for the blue photons, they've got 10 units of energy. So it's going to require 7 units just to free the electron. So for the blue photons, we've got 10 minus 7 equal to 3 eV. So we've kind of got 3 electron volts of leftover energy. And where's that going to go? Some of that energy might be lost as the electron travels through the metal and gets to the surface. In the best case scenario, where the electron's right on the surface, all that extra energy will go into the kinetic energy of the electron. So this 3 eVs, that would go into that would be the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted electrons. So here's an IB question. What I'd like you to do is read it over, try the question, and then come back for the answer. We increase the intensity of the incident light. What changes, if any, will occur to the rate of emission of the electrons and the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons? OK, so that means we're sending in more photons, but they've got the same amount of energy per photon. Now, if we do send in more photons, we should get more electrons. So it should increase in terms of the rate of emission of electrons. Now, in terms of the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons, that's going to stay the same because we haven't increased the frequency, which means we haven't increased the energy per photon. All the photons have the same energy. And it'll take a certain amount of energy to overcome the bonding, and the rest of the energy could, can be used for the kinetic energy of the electrons. So this should be a no change, so the correct answer here is D. Now there is an equation that we sometimes call the photoelectric effect equation, but it's really just based on the idea that we've been talking about. The type of energy that we've got coming in is that photon energy. So our energy in is going to be HF, or we could write it as HC over lambda if we know the wavelength. On the other side of the equation, we want to think about what we get out of that photon energy. And one thing we get out of it is we overcome the work function. We overcome that bonding to the metal itself by the electron. Now, if there's any excess energy left over, that can go into the maximum kinetic energy of the electron. So this here, written either in terms of wavelength or frequency, this here is what we call the photoelectric effect equation. And we use it to solve quite a few different problems. So let's try a few of those now. OK, so let's try a couple of calculations. Uh, read the question over, try the question, and then come back for the answer. Uh, so in this one here, we know our photon energy will go into overcoming that work function. And any additional energy would be the, the maximum kinetic energy of the electron. Now, in the case that we're trying to find out the minimum frequency or the cutoff frequency, and usually we'll give that the symbol F0 for the cutoff frequency. Well, if we're right at that cutoff frequency, then Ke max is going to be 0. And that means that H times our cutoff frequency will equal the work function, which in this case is 4.3 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So the cutoff frequency will be 4.3 times 10 to the minus 19 joules divided by h, which is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. The joules cancel out, and that means we're going to get units of seconds to the minus 1. 
and if you do that uh, calculation, you're going to get a you're going to get a frequency of 6.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz or seconds to the minus one. Okay, so let's try a second problem. Once again, we're going to use this idea that the photon energy is going to be equal to the work function plus the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted electrons. Now, in this particular problem, we're dealing with a wavelength, so we're going to express our photon energy as hc divided by lambda. Our work function is what we're trying to find out, and they're giving us the kinetic energy, but be a little bit careful because they're giving us a value in electron volts. So this is electron volts, and this here is joules. Of course, we have to have the same units on both sides of the equation. And I'd prefer to have electron volts in this case because I know that the work function of metals comes out to typically be between about 1 and 4 or 5 electron volts. So it's nicer to write the work function in terms of electron volts. So I've got to do a little bit of a conversion here. I've got joules. I'm going to have to multiply by the number of, elect of electron volts in a joule in order to convert to electron volts. And of course there is uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules in an electron volt. Another way of saying that is I need to divide by E in order to convert from joules to electron volts. So I can write this as HC all over E times lambda and now this expression here it's in electron volts and I'll have I'll work out my work function in electron volts given that my maximum kinetic energy is in electron volts. So if I do all of that I'm going to get 6.63 that's h times 10 to the minus 34 that'll be joules seconds times c which is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Let's just double check on the units here uh, the joules will cancel out with the joules here. A second in the denominator will cancel out with that second in the numerator. These two meters will cancel out as well. And so I'm going to get units of electron volts. When all that calculation is carried out, you get 4.36 electron volts minus 1.40 electron volts, which gives a final answer for the work function to be 3 0.06 electron volts, or about 3 electron volts. So let's summarize all the results from the video. So the first thing that we talked about was what is the photoelectric effect? Well, it's just when you shine electromagnetic radiation on a metal and electrons are emitted, and we call those electrons photoelectrons. And then we talked about how the photon model makes very different predictions than the wave model for this photoelectric effect. Key differences in the prediction, uh, no time delay for the photon model, you do get a cutoff frequency, and also when you shine a larger intensity light, you get more electrons, but you don't get more energetic electrons. And all of these predictions proved correct. So that what we could say is that the photo at least in the photoelectric effect, electromagnetic radiation was behaving as particles. In other situations, electromagnetic radiation will behave as waves. So it's both a wave and a particle. We talked about how the photon energy is given by E equals HF, or if you knew the wavelength, you'd write that as HC over lambda. And then we finished off by solving a few problems by using this conservation of energy, where we said that the energy coming in from the photon has to go into overcoming this work function and that any additional energy will go into the kinetic energy of those electrons. And that's all for today folks, thank you very much.